February 9th, 2016, regular meeting of the Troy Planning Commission. Copies of the agenda for tonight's meeting are available at the entrance of the room. Additionally, the agendas and minutes of prior meetings are available on the city's website. The meeting will be conducted in accordance with the agenda as presented or amended by the Planning Commission. <coughs> the roles and responsibilities of the Planning Commission are outlined on the reverse side of tonight's agenda. State law establishes planning commissions. The commission is comprised of nine members, all of whom have volunteered to serve. Members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by city council. If you wish to address the planning commission, please come forward when recognized and provide your name and address on the sign-in sheet at the door. Please begin your remarks by stating your name for the benefit of the commissioners. All remarks are to be addressed to the planning commission and not to anyone else in the room. At this time, I ask that all cell phones, Blackberries, PDAs, or any other devices that might disrupt this meeting please either be placed in silent mode or be, or be turned off. Ms. Sardeke, the roll call, please. Mr. Affinidian? Here. Ms. Cruz? Here. Mr. Edmonds? Here. Ms. Faison? Here. Mr. Hudson? Here. Mr. Krent? Here. Ms. Kufa? Here. Mr. Zanzika? Mr. Tagle? Here. Item number two is the approval of the agenda. Uh, Mr. Savinat, did you want to suggest we Yeah, I, I would suggest, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would suggest adding uh, item 6A, Woodland Protection. Okay. Related to the item that's on our table. Related right. to the draft resolution that's on the table, right. yes. Thank you very much. Is there a resolution to that? Thank I'll you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Second? I'll second. Support. Thank you, Mr. Crett. Mr. Crett, Correct, yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Faison? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krant? Yes. Ms. Kufa? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Appahedian? Yes. Agenda item number three is the minutes of the January 26, 2016 meeting. Uh, if there is, a, could I have a resolution to approve? I'll do it. Thank you, Mr. Krant. Second. Second by Mr. Appahedian. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Faison? Abstain. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krant? Yes. Ms. Cooper? Abstain. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Appahidian? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Agenda item number four is public comment for items that are not <coughs> on the agenda. Is there anyone in the room who wants to speak to an item that is not on the agenda? Seeing no one, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number five, which is a special use request and preliminary site plan review. Public hearing. File number SUJPLN 2015-0020, Proposed Korean United Methodist Church, Addition, West Side of Dequinder, South of Square Lake, at 46, or 42,693 Dequinder, Section 20, currently zoned R1C, <coughs> One Family Residential District. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yes, I'd like to uh, ask the commission to step out on this one. This church has retained our organization to do some work for them, so I feel it. Thank you very much for indulging that, and uh, <coughs> we'll, we'll come get you when we're done. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Um, one of the issues that we did review or discuss with the applicant was the issue of parking. Uh, the existing site is well over parked based on our ordinance requirements. Um, they currently have 387 spaces on site. Even with the addition, um, they are also losing six spaces as a result of addition. Even with that addition and the loss of six spaces, they still meet the ordinance requirements for parking. Um, if parking does become a problem in the, uh, or an issue in the future, they have significant area to the north of their proposed uh, building to add additional parking if it should become an issue. We do find that parking is sufficient based on the ordinance requirements at this time. Um, the city's traffic engineer and traffic engineer consultant did review the proposed um, application in, in regards to access, circulation, um, and the need for a traffic study. Uh, it was the conclusion of the traffic consultant that a traffic study is not warranted at this time, and there is not an expectation that due to the increase of the building uh, addition that there will be uh, an increase in the site in terms of additional traffic because most of the space is already occupied uh, by the existing uh, users of that site. Um, there was a question in regards to the neighbors about the warrant for a traffic signal on DeQuinder. Um, the traffic uh, consultant also um, noted that that would need further study, and if that is uh, to be pursued, it needs to be an action of the church or the public going to, starting with the engineering department, about whether a traffic signal is warranted uh, for that location. In regards to landscaping, we do note there is an existing six-foot-high wall that separates the residential properties adjacent to the church. Um, <coughs> the wall will remain in place. A requirement of the zoning ordinance is a landscape buffer for, exist for churches, place of worship, and single family. We do note that this is an existing six foot high wall. Uh, the applicant proposes to maintain that wall um, as for the landscape buffer. We find that should be sufficient uh, if the Planning Commission does uh, agree with that recommendation. Uh, as I noted, they are reconfiguring some of the parking lots. As a result, uh, they have to increase uh, parking lot landscaping. Uh, they are required to put in three additional trees. Um, as a result, the applicant is providing nine trees, so they're in excess of the, uh, of the three that are required. Um, we do note that the proposed uh, additional landscaping is outside of the actual parking lot on the perimeter. That is allowed to be approved by the Planning Commission um, if, if they deem that the, that the landscape plan is sufficient. Um, based on orange requirements. Uh, lastly, there are seven standards that are considered as part of a special use. This includes compatibility with adjacent uses, compatibility with the master plan, traffic impacts, public um, impact on public services, as well as impact on the environment. <coughs> we have reviewed the standards and do find that they do meet all the required standards. We also find that the proposed use is a place of worship and will remain so in the expansion um, is compatible with adjacent uses. We find that the applicant is proposing increased landscaping in the maintenance of the existing six-foot wall to mitigate impacts on the adjacent property owners. And we do find that the proposed addition should not cause a significant increase in public services. Based on those findings, we do recommend site plan approval. Thank you. Any question for the uh, planning consultant this evening? Yes. Mrs. Cruz. Um, on the stormwater detention, I was looking for Mr. Sandika. Um, I'm not clear on whether their detention ponds are going to be sufficient. Um, you quoted some stormwater narrative that indicates it's uh, split into two detention systems, blah, blah, blah. It will provide the additional storage based on the increase in impervious area due to the proposed improvements and any additional volume that is needed to meet. So I, I'm not really understanding what they're doing for um, stormwater. And I did note in the soils, you indicated that drainage may be poor. So if that's the case, just want to make sure that we're yeah. doing everything we can to make sure that that's sufficiently handled. The preliminary stormwater plan has been reviewed by engineering. They do find that the size is sufficient based on preliminary engineering. Again, final engineering has to take place after the preliminary site plan. So those final details we worked out as, as part of final engineering. But the size and volume as shown is, uh, has been preliminary re re reviewed and approved by the engineering department. And then I also noticed you didn't make any comment about whether or not they were employing best practices with the stormwater management. Yes? They no? are not. They are not. They are not. I do, just one thing I did uh, did not note in my report that I wanted to raise is that um, post the, my draft of, of my memo, there was a concern uh, raised by uh, an adjacent property owner in regards to the location of the dumpster.
dumpster on site. Uh, the dumpster right now, I believe, is located in the, this corner of the site, which is adjacent to, to residential. Um, they're not proposing to remove or relocate that dumpster location, but I do want the applicant to, to explain the, the, the proposed, the shown location of that dumpster and if there are opportunities to put it in a different location. Anything else? If not, is the uh, applicant present? Please go to the microphone. Since I've been here, obviously. <laughs> yes, good evening. Uh, Jim Butler with PEA. Our address is 2430 Rochester Court, Suite 100, Troy, Michigan, 48083. Um, also with me this evening is the architect, the representatives from the church, and the construction manager for the project. I um, want to clear up a few items from Mr. Carlisle's review. I think he did a pretty good job explaining the project. A couple items. The coverage of the lot were allowed up to 30%. Did a calculation with the building addition. Um, it covers 15% of the site. So with the existing building and the 16,000, we're only still at 15%. Um, related to the stormwater management, um, this site was developed long, 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 long time ago. And there's a real shallow storm outlet out on Dequinda Road. How long ago? Because my wife and I were trying to remember when this church went in. I want to say the plans that I looked at were from the 80s. Yeah. 1988 to be correct. Thank you, sir. There we go. Um, the storm sewer outlet at that time was a ditch. The Gwinder Road was only two lanes, and it was a very shallow outlet to it. And as you see, right now there is no detention basin. Typically in that time you'd have a, an above-ground detention basin. What they were allowed to do was to use surface detention. They would use the surface of the parking lot. they put a smaller pipe in, and it would bubble up and store on the parking lot. So that's why you don't see a basin. But with the addition of the building, we're taking up some green space, adding some more parking. We're now having an issue with the amount of storage because we're taking up some of that area. So that's why we're putting a basin in. That basin is just for the additional stormwater we're making and increasing for the site. So it's not handling the entire site. The site will have still surface detention on the north lot. It'll have surface detention on the south lot, <coughs> and where we're building, we're going to have that small basin, which will handle that site. So with that, any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them, or representatives from the design team can certainly help. Questions from the planning commission for the uh, developer? If not, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Carl mentioned the, um, the, the dumpster location. That's existing today. Or Mr. Yeah, it is, it is an existing dumpster located such where Mr. Carlisle has shown that dumpster. And I guess, um, how would you address the uh, resident who says that that's in a, a bad location? Well, if we, would, if we were to move it, we would either put it along the east or west property line which would be adjacent to neighbors and be unscreened. Right now it's screened by a very significant berm along the south property line. There's landscaping and a berm that's there, fairly visible. I think any other place we'd put it, it would be visible and it might be a nuisance to the others. You know, if we correct the situation, we might correct it and make it worse look for others. The, you looked at the north property line, no place along there? Um, I'm not in familiar, and I'd have to talk with some representatives about <coughs> the interaction of how trash is handled. Um, I'm assuming it was put in that location for a reason. Like any other business, it's you know you don't want to take it all the way through the building. If you put it on the north end, I don't I don't know I don't know how the management of that works. So I don't like I really can't answer that question. I wonder if there's someone here from the church who can talk about the management of that and what time pickup is that? How many times per week? Uh, maybe perhaps there's a way in management to make this a better situation for the property owner to the south. Right. I can speak to that. Yes, um, thank you. By the way, go to the microphone and, and uh, let us know your name and sign in, please. Yeah. 
Um, my name is uh, Timothy Yu. I'm representing Korean United Methodist Church. I am um, one of the elders and serving the construction committee as uh, a public relations and communication director. Um, in regards to that issues of uh, dumpster being that um, located there, um, the, to, to answer your question uh, directly, the garbage dumpster pickup uh, happens twice a week, very early morning, like 5.30, um, 6 o'clock, or sometimes even earlier. So uh, we try to resolve that with the, um, the waste management company, but it is very hard for them to send the special truck to pick it up like in the middle of the day. So we will continue to work with them to not to disturb that early morning. And then same time, we'll have a serious discussion about finding better locations. Um, but right now, uh, the only, I guess only option we have is move the location to a different uh, location. But now the building, uh, the new house is being built across the street of Dequinder on the um, east side. And north, we're not sure um, how far we're going to go with the basins uh, and the future plan. Um, we, we need a series of more studies about this. So the basin, if I may follow up, so the basin is not as represented on the plan, or it is? The, the water basin? Yes. I guess it is. Now it's our uh, plan. If that is the best way to manage the uh, storm water, then we have to uh, make it part of it part of our overall plan, over plan. Okay, I'm a little perplexed, but Ms. Cruz, you had a question? Uh, on, the, on the basin, was there a reason that, I mean, did you guys discuss with the applicant the best practices for the storm water retention pond? I, it seems like it's been sort of a focus um, as we have looked at storm water management as a, as a body, we want to to encourage people to use best practices when it when it comes to stormwater management, and um, I, I'm having a hard time conceptualizing what this is ultimately going to look like or or be. And then you know I, I would like to hear those words. Oh, we're using best practices. Mr. Carlisle, could you point out or would you uh, point out where where is the proposed new basin? outline of the existing church. Yes. This is the proposed addition. The proposed basin is just to the north of the existing church line. This is the existing <coughs> parking lot line. So it's in that grassy area. The grassy area to, uh, to the north of the parking lot. <coughs> and would that provide a place for uh, best management practices at that point? I'd have to, I'd have to consult with the applicant or the engineer on that. This presents a challenge from an engineering perspective because it is a system that is in place today. Um, we could certainly go and add more pavement, add more storage to the, the surface of the parking lot. I think this does represent some of a best practice in stormwater management. Is it the best? No, I'll be honest with you. But I think it represents something that's a departure from what was done previously, where it was just stored on the, par on the surface of the parking lot. We are providing a depressed area we are providing landscaping around it. We are providing the opportunity for some potential infiltration. Unfortunately, the soils are not well draining, as you noted. But I think this is a, a better practice than what is there. Is it, like I said, is it the best? No, but it is a better than, than what's there today. Well, I don't think the Planning Commission would encourage more pavement. Uh, in fact, I, I was out there uh, yesterday and Church is providing some budget in this new addition for the repair of that parking lot. It's it's a it's a disaster. It really is a mess. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Just, to, just to be clear, so that we we all understand, I want to be clear in my mind. When we talk about surface parking, Mr. Butler, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the standard in Troy is you can you're able to store up to I believe 16 inches of of, uh, of water in the, on the surface parking. Is that correct? 16 inches. It's, it's somewhere around that number. Yeah, so, it's somewhere so in that neighborhood. Depending on wh if it's a busy parking lot, you'll notice that on a rainy day, you can tell where the 
where these, these, these deep spots are because no one parks there because if they open the door and they step out of their car, they get, they get you know, that, they step in a puddle that deep. It, that's, how they're just, that's how they've been designed is to temporarily store the water on the surface of the parking lot. Am I correct, Mr. You're Cole? correct. But I guess that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, why would you not, if, you, if you're gonna put in a, a basin, why, I just don't understand the logic behind it. And, and so that, that's okay with our ordinances as they what? exist today? In 1988, when this was constructed, that was standard operating procedure. Yeah, but how about today? They're making a site plan that's changed. And and we, can we raise that issue? <coughs> well, what they're doing is is that they're addressing and improving that that system of stormwater detention <coughs> in this in this area where the the uh, improvements being made, but w they're not forced to do it for the entire site. Okay. Anyone else? I have just a quick comment, Mr. Fred. The getting back to the the trash uh, pickup. <coughs> Uh, personally, I know what it sounds like at 5.30 in the morning because a building not far from me, I, we hear that big steel bang in the morning. And I'm thinking that that area on the north part, there is a, there's, it's a lovely pocket in there off the north parking lot, just to the, just to the east of the parking lot, it's all grassy. If that, that would, to me, make a, and it could be easily screened. And if there's nothing around there as far as uh, anything but the road, a parking lot and a lot of grass to the north of that I'm just thinking that would be an ideal location for a dumpster and you know okay so they're gonna have to walk across that parking lot instead of going through the building to the south is it is it feasible <coughs> sure it is but is it you know on a daily basis to collect their trash and take it out there if they had a you know a rolling cart or however they handle their trash uh, to me it makes a lot of sense it would alleviate long-term problem with the neighbor to the south. Uh, it doesn't have to even affect the people on the far uh, west at all. So I'm just looking for input from the owner, uh, the, the church uh, officials to say, you know, why can't we, why can't you move it over there? I mean, it just, is there a, such a horrible thing to move the trash 100 feet that way or 200 feet this way? I mean, I'm just trying to figure that out. You, know, you got a nice neighbor, I mean, you might as well cooperate with them. Perhaps you want to respond. <coughs> Well, thank you for uh, the suggestion. Um, it, well, we've been talking about that topic um, for past um, several years, to be honest. Um, the reason that we could not make the decision because we weren't sure how we were going to completely use our property. Okay. So now we know all the site plans is, is developed. Now we know probably what you said is probably right, that east, north side, somewhere around there, with enlarged parking space, I think we can fulfill the uh, issues. But I, I mentioned earlier that across the street, uh, the Dequinder, there are new houses coming in there. So if we have a dumpster there and then garbage pickup truck comes in at five o'clock and do make that noise, then we may hear a complaint from the Stalling Heights new uh, resident. So. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's across the road. It's not. Right. This one's right adjacent to that house. Right. You've got a. a I, don't, I don't know how many lanes it is on Dequinder at that point. Maybe five. You know. You, and plus, there's road traffic and all that going on. I just think it'd be a, a better spot. Um, I, I agree. If you could do that, I would be appreciated. If you're willing to do that, <laughs> we could yeah. put that within the uh, resolution. Absolutely. Thank yep. you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? hearing and we'll allow here from uh, members of the audience who would like to uh, comment on this. If anyone else would like to comment? I have a few comments. Dr. Pulver, like to and chime in, sir. Uh, my name is Marcel and I live, uh, sorry, Marcel, Marcel. What's your last name? Silla. My name is Marcel Silla. I live on the property address 42503 Dequinda Road. Uh, we just want to I just want to say that we're not the neighbor that's been complaining about the the garbage however my biggest concern is the the traffic light uh, on Sundays when uh, whenever there's service there's usually a Troy police that comes that handles <coughs> the, the, the traffic 
it was not like that previously, but if we can uh, develop a plan for <coughs> traffic light there, uh, there's definitely 300 cars that come in every Sunday, and during uh, at one o'clock they leave. It do does become a little congested, and uh, over the we've been an owner of that property since 2008, and I think there's been at least three to four accidents. I mean, at the middle of the night, whenever there are people trying to leave, they we, they don't they don't stop and they just ram the car that's driving on the Quinter Road. So it's the planning, I have no objection or no concerns with it. It's just about the traffic management from the church to the, the Quinter Road. Uh, that could lead to you know, less accidents. And then I've been, I could hear from my house, I could hear whenever there's an accident from the church driving to the Quinter. I can always hear it, I step outside trying to stay away from the accident, see what's going on, maybe call 911 and uh, get help out there. But I've noticed at least three accidents there. So my only suggestion will be if we can have a, uh, the engineers or city work for a traffic light. That That's the best plan. Happen? Happen? Uh, there has to be, the, the traffic light has to be warranted and there's just our engineering department, our engineering department would be involved in the study to, to determine if there's a warrant for the traffic light. And that's based on how many trips per day are going by the site, how many are entering and leaving the site, et cetera. And who um, has to request that? Um, our engineer, it would be requested through our engineering department. But our, they're aware of the application. Um, they, they're, they're aware that, that this would be um, coming before them for <coughs> final review and that that, uh, that time they'll have an opportunity to study it further. Well, that's the point at which it would be only in the final. Potentially, review. yes. I, based on based on the first review by OHM, it appears that it's, it likely is not warranted, based on how the size and the, the, the number of parishioners, <coughs> et cetera. But during final review, they'll have another another bite at the apple. So the, the term "not warranted" would mean it's not required. Not justified. Not, not required. Justified, yes, right. Okay. So I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's no more comments from the audience. We'll uh, close the public hearing and bring it back to the uh, Planning Commission for a resolution. Ms. Crew. Um, the only other thing that I have is um, there's a comment here in the report. There is an existing six foot high wall along the perimeter of the property. The existing wall is compliant with Planning Commission approval. Does it mean that without our approval, it's not compliant? Yeah, so the requirement for uh, a land use, um, alternative land use is, is you either have to provide a berm right. or landscaping right. or a wall can be provided with planning commission approval. This is an existing wall. Right. So um, the planning commission, I, I, I would assume, has the authority to have them remove that wall, put in a berm or landscaping, but we think since the wall is existing, we haven't heard any um, issues or complaints from any adjacent neighbors. We right. think the wall is sufficient. It still does require the planning commission to, to say yes, the wall is uh, fine. And to piggyback in that, the wall was a condition of approval when the original special use was granted back in 1988. So the planning commission at that time thought that it was appropriate. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Cooper. There were two public comments included in our packet. Were they given to the applicant as well? The two public comments, I, I assume, were on the, the traffic light issue and the dumpster enclosure. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, they were included in the packet and were provided to the applicant. Okay. Is someone willing to um, do it on a resolution? So, um, this <coughs> is a special use request and preliminary site plan review file number SUJPLN 215-0020, proposed Korean United Methodist Church, addition west side of Jaquinder, south of uh, Square Lake at uh, 42693 Jaquinder, section 20, currently zoned R1C, one family residential district. Resolve that special use request and preliminary site plan approval for the Im uh, improvements proposed by the Korean United Methodist Church addition 
west side of Equinder, south of Square Lake. Again, at the same address, 42693 Dequinder, Section 20. Oh, I'm repeating myself. Currently zoned R1C, one county uh, residential district. Be granted subject to moving the trash um, dumpster from where it's located presently to a northeast uh, section of the uh, um, property. Yes. And, and screened and gated as per. Oh, requirements absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is there a second to the motion? Ms. Cooper, thank you. Any further discussion? If not, the roll call, please. Mr. Draper? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Ms. Cooper? Yes. Ms. Gabrielli? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Does anyone want a water? Yes, I would love yes, it. Thank you. How many? One here. One, two, three, four, four. Take a two two minute break. Okay. APLN 2015-0016, proposed estates at Willowbrook, 28 units or lots on the east side of John R., south of Waddles, section 24, currently zoned R1C, one family residential district. Who's taking it? I'll do it. Carla? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to the, uh, to the chairman. Um, this last, this item was last reviewed by the Planning Commission at their last meeting on January 26th. Um, the applicant has um, submitted a revised plan, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I have a very brief report. I just really want to highlight some of the, the outstanding issues and what the changes are based on, on those issues. There were six outstanding issues, and I'd classify them, I'd classify four of them as, as rather minor. And the four that I'd classify as minor were issues of the turnaround on Sandpiper and McGaw, McCaw Drive, widening of the John R. sidewalk to eight feet, um, providing more diversity in the tree species or the street trees in the green belt, and resubmitting floor plans that meet ordinance requirements. All four of those, what I would deem as minor issues, have been resolved, and they do all comply with ordinance requirements. Um, however, there were two uh, major outstanding um, items in the discussion. And the first was uh, the proposed outlot that the developer had shown, which is located uh, in the southeast corner of the site, it's this location. As we noted in our initial review, that outlot did, did not meet the size requirements of the lot requirement in the zoning district. Um, and so we had some concerns about the future control and maintenance of that outlot and who would be the responsibility for that. 
The applicant has provided proposed master deed language uh, that will be reviewed by the uh, city attorney's office um, and notes that they, as the property owner, the developer owned, uh, retained the right for six years to control that property, uh, at which time uh, it would be converted and turned over to the homeowners association. Uh, that language will be reviewed by the city, like I noted, the city's attorney's office to make sure that it meets uh, all legal requirements. The second issue uh, for discussion was uh, tree preservation and tree buffering. Um, the Planning Commission had uh, expressed concerns and a desire, um, also as well as the neighbor, <coughs> neighbors have, had expressed a desire for increased tree preservation and tree buffering, specifically along the eastern property line adjacent to the single family residential neighborhood. Um, the applicant went back uh, and resurveyed the area within that 25 foot buffer adjacent to the property, the 25 foot wetland preservation buffer adjacent to those properties. Um, and in that review, they located or identified an additional uh, 35 trees that are at least 10 inches or greater. There's, um, there's a, uh, there's a provision in the existing tree survey requirements which note that you only record, you only have to um, survey trees that are between four and 10 inches. So in their initial review, they only counted trees that were before those four and 10, between those four and 10 inches. Um, post the first meeting, they went back and looked at the tree survey and identified all the trees in that buffer that were greater than 10 inches, which again was not is not required in our current tree survey requirements. As a result, they identified additional 35 trees that are, are greater than 10 inches. 33 of those 35 are located within the 25 foot buffer. Again, the 25 foot buffer adjacent to those property owners. So in total, they're preserving 54 trees that are at least four inches or greater in that in that eastern bu buffer and they're preserving 23 trees along the northern property line. So in total, they're preserving approximately um, 75 trees or more um, uh, on the site that are at least four inches or greater. I, uh, we are open to any questions from the Planning Commission. Any, class, any questions for the Planning Consultant, Mr. Faisal? So you, you mentioned the survey requires uh, counting trees between four and 10 inches. Yes. And then these additional trees are above the What's the logic behind the four to 10 inch? It stems from our existing landscape design and tree preservation standards that was crafted in, I believe, 1975. And I think the logic is, is the, the trees below four inches, in, and I didn't write this, I'm just <laughs> trying to answer your question. Uh, trees less than four inches in diameter um, are not significant yet and really don't play much of a, don't mm -hmm. provide much of a function of anything. And trees that are greater than 10 inches are of such an age that they're really not going to be around that much longer, and they're not that. That I, again, I didn't trying to explain. I've I've tried to wrap my hands around this when I first started here years ago, and um, I believe that's the logic. Um, it, I, I will note that's not current best practices according no. to <laughs> no to uh, to current uh, horticulture, uh, and, and and those as you if you listen to our discussion last night at city council in regards to woodland protection. Those trees that are 10 or 10 or inches or greater are, are very valuable trees that we actually are trying to preserve and protect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they, they play actually, the, the bigger the tree, the greater the role in terms of right. absorption of water and shade and right. et cetera. Okay. Any other questions? Ms. Cruz. With respect to the trees that are larger than 10 inches along the um, eastern property line and the northern property line, Correct me if I'm wrong, but but didn't the original plan include those trees? They just hadn't been counted. I, I mean, I'm, I, I guess my understanding was that the applicant all along was going to sort of keep the the trees along the boundaries, right? right? But there was never any intention to to clear cut that area. The intent to clear cut was inside. Um, where the houses were going to be built. I think what the applicant has done is they've clarified and provided additional information in regards to the amount of trees that they're preserving within that 25 foot buffer. They've not identified, they're not indicating that these are new trees they're preserving, they're just clarifying what they are preserving. What, what is there to be preserved and will stay Correct. intact, but they're sti still clear cutting the rest of the, the property um, with just a, a perimeter border on the north 
and eastern property lines. <sighs> Are we opening it up for discussion? Well, we have to still hear from the applicant. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can go on if you want. Okay. No, I'm done for now. The applicant present. Joe Maniachi from Langham Investments. Um, <clears throat> I'm willing to take any questions for from the board. Um, just want to clarify a couple things though ahead of time. Um, I know in the last meeting water management and drainage was uh, an issue and just to clarify that uh, all our site, all the water that is on our property will be maintained on our property and will not spill over to the, the neighbor's properties. Um, we will be cleaning up any of the standing water that happens during the rainfalls and taking care of that and using the detention basin for that issue. Um, as mentioned earlier, we made adjustments to the plan to meet um, some of the comments that were brought forth in the last meeting and as stated in the last meeting, this plan does meet all your ordinances that you guys required. The tree buffer was not a uh, requirement of the, uh, of the ordinance, but we put that in there as because I know you guys were meet, going towards the well, um, woodland protection, so we thought we'd meet you halfway um, between the old ordinance and the new. Um, so that's why we established a tree buffer um, to help accommodate and save the, what trees we could on the property. Questions for the applicant, please. Ms. Cruz. Um, is there a reason why you would not be willing to add some trees to the interior we will of be, the site plan? We will be doing adding trees in the landscaping plan per the requirements of the city ordinances. So you're still intent on just meeting the requirements of the city ordinances and not going above or beyond? I believe this plan does go far above and beyond the city ordinances by allowing to remain or keeping the trees that are on the property along the, that the buffer, buffer side. On the buffer side? Because otherwise both buffers. you, would, you yeah. would cut all that down? What's that? Otherwise you would cut all that down? I, we're leaving them on this site. I mean, I mean, I don't understand the question. My question was originally you had planned on removing all of the trees on the buffer? My original submittal was to leave a buffer of trees. We were, it was a, an option that was available to us to leave the tree buffer, so we did. It was not re a requirement of the ordinance, so I believe we met and exceeded the ordinance regarding trees on the property. And I know one last thing that was mentioned at the meeting about the traffic flow through Dexter. I know it's the city's, our planning commission's um, intent to have thoroughfares and connectivity. I do know it's an issue with the homeowners next door. We'd be willing not to connect and maybe just put a sidewalk through if that's <coughs> something that the Planning Commission sees fit. Any comment on that item? Okay, I think we're ready to uh, open it up to the public hearing and we'll uh, listen, uh, hear any comments from uh, anyone else in the audience. Please be sure you have signed in directly into the microphone, please, and give us your name. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pete Wilkins. Um, I'm the resident of 3905 Wayfair, uh, which is lot eight on that diagram there. Um, so first of all, to clarify, um, Mr. Savadant, you said that the um, the reason it is between four and ten inches, um, the ten inch maximum uh, limit on there, as written in that uh, document that you forwarded to my neighbor, um, says that those trees may not survive construction, right? So that, that's a may not survive construction. Um, I think the point that I would like to make is that um, I don't feel that there has been um, due diligence to preserve some of those mature trees. Um, and by making adjustments to, you know, the lot sizes, their placement, the units that are sitting on those lots, there are trees there that could be preserved outside of there. That buffer zone contains 
pretty small trees, right? They're between four and 10 inches. There are trees that are further back in that, from that 25 foot buffer zone that are massive. Um, if you look tree 417 on there, which I think sits in right inside unit 11, I think, um, uh, unit, oh, I'm sorry, unit 10. Um, 417 is about, nah, I don't know, five inches in diameter. Right next to it is something that you can't even fit your, your hands around. It's one of the tallest trees in that area. It towers over everything else. You can see it for miles. And these are the trees that I'm, I would say that you'd want to preserve. If you actually care about keeping any of that natural beauty, those are the trees that you want to preserve. And you can do that with careful planning. And all I'm seeing from this planning, no offense, is that we're trying to get maximum money. How much can, of this unit can I cram on these lots? And if you, if you notice on this 25-foot uh, this buffer zone, um, according to a drawing further up in here, maybe about two or three pages up, they noted, they indicate there's a setback, 40-foot setback from the units um, 13, 7 through 13. There's a 40-foot setback to the property lines of the adjacent properties <coughs> to the east. And 25 feet of that is buffer zone, which is not going to be removed. There is no fill-in or anything else, which is, which is good. I, I, I like the fact that we're preserving that. But who is going to be happy with a 15-foot backyard? That's probably less than the distance of this table right here. And I think that we're going to be continually fighting against the owners of those properties to try and expand out those yards to cut, uh, cut down trees or lay out, uh, rip out all the brush and lay out grass to try and extend their backyards. I just don't feel that preservation was, uh, there was a good balance between preservation and uh, design of these units. So I, I just want to leave that with all of you. I, I really urge you that you should vote no and that we should get some plans that are maybe a little bit more thought out, that are a little bit more creative, um, and go from there. The second point that I'd like to make is if this does go through, I'm still very concerned about the drainage here. Um, we have lots of standing water that sits there throughout all of winter and into the spring. The water builds up and it remains there even into the summertime. If you're only reducing, you're building up this, this area here and only leaving that 25 foot buffer zone, I understand that you can grade the land and you can try and get the water to flow into the storm sewers and everything else on the roadway there, but there's still going to be uh, some drainage that goes backwards to the east. I mean, right now, the wetlands, if you look at the way that everything's laid out on there, everything is moving to the east right now. It happens to come right up about to the property line and rest there. My concern is that, you know, you, you can assure me that the engineering department is going to do due diligence, and I appreciate that, but engineering only goes so far. I'm an engineer myself. Um, we have quality assurance and testing and, you know, we have accountability. So if we do make a mistake, that someone can rectify that. And I don't see anything here that's going to tell me that if, you know, water is draining into my property, that there's anything I can do other than start a massive legal battle to try and get, uh, you know, my land taken care of. So I would like to see some language in there that says if water is draining to the east, that it will be addressed. Seth, don't you want to explain the, what our ordinance requires in terms of <coughs> adjoining properties that the no uh, the water uh, can drain onto adjoining properties? Well, Mr. Wilkins just touched on it. That this will have to be designed in such a way that that drainage from this property does not negatively impact the neighbors. That's that's, that's why uh, the first step in this pro process is preliminary site plan approval. And once, uh, if and when they get preliminary site plan approval, their engineer submits final engineering drawings that are detailed and our engineering department ensures that there's no negative drainage that, that affects these properties in any way. And if there were such drainage that did affect them, what would their recourse be? Would they be going back to the engineering department? We would work with the city to, to alleviate the, the, uh, the issue. Yeah. But I, I agree with the gentleman that he should not be as occurred, it would not be up to him to mount a, a very expensive legal uh, uh, program against the city to, to do that, right? I think it's up, it's up to the city to, 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 to 
defend their organs and, and to make sure that that doesn't occur. Well, we've got, we've got, we we deal with this potential issue in every site plan, I know. I know. and that's why, that's why we have a professional engineering department sure. that spends a lot of time Agreed. working with this issue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who wants to speak on this item? If not, we'll bring it back to the uh, close the hearing and uh, bring it back to the Planning Commission for uh, further discussion or resolution. Well, I've got some thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. It was uh, my objection at the last meeting concerning the outline. And I have read very carefully the proposed master deed language concerning that outline. But let me do a little background so you can understand my concerns. And if you think this is uh, elementary, uh, it probably is. Condominium is the word that uh, we attach to the process by which you can take a parcel of land, in this case it's 10 acres, and you can sell individual parcels with ownership. Condominiums take a couple of shapes. One is an apartment complex, in essence. You've got the apartment, but everybody owns their own individual apartment. And there's detached condos, which is like a regular subdivision, except it's part of a condominium association. <coughs> in a building where there's a condominium, there are things called general common elements. What would those be? Those would be exterior features, such as a roof, Maybe plumbing, uh, parks, perhaps landscaping. In this case, the only general common element as set forth in this proposed language is the outline. And I must say it's an unusual provision they've got here. And they say, by the way, you buy your lot here, there are 28 <coughs> lots, you each will own uh, 128 of the common area or the common element, which is the outlot. The general common elements are usually governed or administered by a condominium association in which everyone who purchases a lot and puts a home in there is a member of this association. Now, this says that if the developer does not elect to put a structure on this outlot by purchasing some additional property to the south, he has the right to take that common element away from the association and put a home on there. Well, here's where I have some problems. The association under this proposed language is required to maintain the property. If in fact it's taken in the six year period, is the association gonna be reimbursed the cost for maintaining this property? Second, and I'm a lawyer, and I've been a lawyer for a long time, trying to figure out the process by which the developer can take this outlot. Is it by a uh, power coupled with an interest? Is it a springing use? Perhaps a constructive trust? A power of appointment? I don't know, is it gonna take 28 signatures of lot owners to convey this property? Can the association do it? Is it empowered to do that? If in fact you get over that hurdle and that lot's taken, shouldn't the association and the condominium association be paid the fair market value for that lot? Shouldn't they also be reimbursed for their maintenance costs of that lot? So I suggest to you that the one concern <coughs> I had was apparently addressed by making the association pay the maintenance of that outlaw. But I raise these other ones. I'm not satisfied that this is a good arrangement for a condom meeting with the city of Troy. Thank you. I tend to agree. Um, some uh, requests that they might do to meet your I'd concerns. suggest they talk to a lawyer and come back with a good explanation on uh, 
what they propose to do. I'm not going to do it for them. So, uh, so your recommendation maybe is that I'm going to vote no if uh, right. we come to a vote. Well, we do have the option of postponing this item to a later meeting even to allow the applicant to address the concern that you have. Ms. Cruz. Well, as many of you know, I too have concerns about this development. Um, I have different concerns from Mr. Hudson's, although I, I don't want to diminish his in any way. I think that they're, they're reasonable and they're valid. Um, I have spoken before about what I think the duty of the Planning Commission is um, and why we're here and how our role is to strike a balance between what I call the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Um, Mr. Hudson has, has brought before you very valid concerns about the letter of the law in this case. Um, we have heard from a member of the audience tonight and also have emails in our packet from residents in the city who are trying to address the spirit of the law and the tree preservation and clear cutting of the land and their opposition to it. I'm of the opinion that as a planning commission, um, <clears throat> there should never be anything that comes before us for approval or for a vote that doesn't meet the minimum requirements under our ordinances. As far as I'm concerned, if it doesn't meet the minimum, I shouldn't see it. And if the role of the Planning Commission is not to find the balance as members of this community between what is in the best interest of the city of Troy and what is good for the health, the welfare, and the safety of our neighbors in relation to the letter of the law, then we're not really needed. If we're going to only approve those projects that meet the letter of the law, then staff can do that. Why bring that in front of us? But we've created a commission, and we've also created public hearings because we've decided that it's important to know what the residents think, what the constituency wants, how things balance in our city. And we don't need more Bigfoot homes. We have discussed as a body the need for housing that addresses our younger people, the people that go away to college and don't come back to Troy because they have no place to live, or our senior people because there's no place for them to downsize. And so what we have in front of us today is a developer who wants to give us housing that we don't really need, clear cut the land, and then play around with the letter of the law on a master deed. So where's the balance? That's what we have to strike. Um, personally, I'm going to vote no, because I don't think this is what this city needs. And if we're going to go after the vision and the effort and the time and the energy of our discussions about what we think Troy should look like, based on what we're being told is needed, then we have to start putting our money where our mouth is. To continue to just allow things to come into Troy because they meet the minimum requirements says to everyone, we're okay with mediocrity. That's good. I'm not okay with mediocrity. I want better. And I think the people that live in this city want better. And I would oh, add to that, I would also vote no because we're going against uh, the letter of the law. Some of those laws are outdated and need to be modified. We know that, that four to 10 inches that Mr. Faison brought up, 
Frank gave us a wonderful answer for that, and we're laughing, but it's unfortunate that we have that as our law right now. And we need to have a better way of encouraging development while still protecting what our city wants to be. And I, I hear that from residents all over, that clear cutting is not what we want. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Tagle, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, uh, I'm coming from this from a little different perspective than, than those that have already spoken, but I support their views because it's something that I have talked about for years about the quality of what comes in front of us from a design standpoint. And uh, I think raising the bar uh, is a good thing. And I think uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will probably vote no on this for, uh, for the reasons mentioned tonight. Anyone else? I, Mr. Affidavit. I, I, I wanted to just kind of, the, the way I'm looking at it is, um, partly through the prism of the decision that was taken by city council last night of a board of three to not approve the ordinance that we put forth through them. So I, that's one way that I'm looking at it. So from our perspective, I guess the discussion here is we're trying to say, uh, well, the developers that are coming in our city need to abide by more than just a minimum letter of the law, there should be some kind of spirit of the law incorporated, but on the other hand, we have the city council that just last night said, we're okay with the minimum letter of the law, and anything beyond that is more objective, is more subjective, and left to the interpretation of the developer and we're here to basically say, are they meeting the minimum letter of the law rather than try to, we're, we're trying to, I guess, push the envelope to say, to define, we haven't re really even defined what is the spirit of the law. That's kind of what I'm struggling with, that we're trying to, trying to define what the spirit of the law is now in terms of tree preservation. Um. Uh, Chris. It's my understanding from council, the council meeting last night, um, that it wasn't that council disagreed with the ordinance itself and said, oh no, clear cutting is a good thing and we don't need to protect trees. That's not why they said no. They said no because they wanted the opportunity to have a study session to review in more detail the language that's in the ordinance. And they weren't given what they thought was the ample opportunity to sit down as a body and review the ordinance, the proposed language, and have a discussion over it. So the, the no vote was more to do with we didn't have enough time to really make an informed decision and nothing to do with we think clear cutting is great and there's no need to preserve trees in this city. And when I talk about the spirit of the law, what I'm talking about is this balance that we're trying to, to strike. I mean, of course we want every developer coming in here, everyone that brings uh, a proposal in front of us for site plan approver, approval to meet the minimum requirements. We absolutely want that. That is the letter of the law. But under the spirit of the law, we're trying to strike that balance between that minimum or the requirement and what it is the people of this city have expressed that they want and as the, what they need. And for us to use our discretion as we discuss and take a vote or hold a public hearing to make sure that those things occur. Because otherwise, I would submit to you that if it was just about ordinance requirements, Brent has a stamp, and he could sit at his desk and stamp his approval on it, and we're not needed. We're here for a reason, 
and that's to make sure that the letter of the law is followed and the spirit of the law is discussed and considered in the best interests, health, welfare, and safety of all of the residents of the city. Anyone else? Just Mr. Clayton's on. Absent more guidance, I, I find it difficult to define, even though you can't specifically define the spirit of the law, I, I'd have difficulty framing what would be an acceptable project. You know, so, so we talked about, Mr. Bruce talked about the things that, that we've talked about as a body, that we've heard the people say about the direction we want the city to go in. Absent that, what's our framework for making decisions? Thank you. Mr. Craig. I'm sorry. I, I'm great. <laughs> well, I have two things. One, I want to congratulate and thank Mr. Hudson for doing that, digging into the agreement. I didn't do that, and I really appreciate you doing that. I totally agree. The, the agreement between the, uh, the, the developer and the uh, homeowners has to be clearly spelled out. And what I heard tonight, it isn't spelled out at all very clearly. And if anything, it, it could, I could see some arguments and contention and probably legal things developing out of that. Um, uh, so I, I, I would vote no immediately just on that one element alone. It's, it needs to be very clearly stated who's responsible at what <coughs> point in time before six years, who may, obviously it's, it's already stated there, the homeowners are gonna maintain it, but what happens, who, who's, who pays the cost of that? Does it ever get reimbursed? Do they get, when the property is, if it is sold uh, for another house, who gets the money from that sale? Those are critical things to me, and they're, they're missing in the, the agreement. Second, I wanna jump on what uh, John Tegel said uh, about the appearance. You know, I was looking at the four uh, fronts of the, <coughs> the facades. It's the identical building four times. They adjusted, a few, you know, I mean, the layout where the garage is, where the uh, entrance door is, uh, the shape of the of the, uh, <coughs> uh, the facade itself. I mean, there's minor changes to windows, uh, minor changes to the roof line, uh, but it's the same house. And I just wanted to ask really, um, probably Brent, uh, we were talking at another development about having enough individuality, in, in other words, side by side, um, Homes, how they should differ, and what's the what's the scale or what's the uh, way we can judge? Is it different enough? To me, these are not different enough at all. It's the same house, um, so that's the other point. And I think we need to have another study session talking on that specific item. But in this case, I don't see enough difference to meet our ordinance requirements for variety going down the street. Mr. Sadler, in terms of variety, what what we typically get. Uh, as part of the application, the the uh, applicant provides typical elevations, mm -hmm. uh, front ele tip front elevations, and when building permits are submitted, we our building city building official reviews to ensure that there's variation along the streetscape, mm -hmm. so there's staggering of, of building faces and there's different <laughs> elements and there's a there's a formula that I don't I don't do the review but mm -hmm. but our, our building official does. So that we don't have the same elevations side by side by side by side. Um, I was actually talking to the developer of today that I believe you spoke with about the same issue, Correct. not too far from your house. Correct. And I think um, what happened in that in that instance is is there were uh, there were some homes that were there was home vacant lot home vacant lot and and it, it, as you drove by it looked like there was it was the same but the, the, the pieces hadn't been filled in to give a complete picture of what things look like but there. There are there's a formula there's a, there's you know variations in architectural features that that mix it so that it's not this boring sameness. So in this in this instance, I'm sure many, Mr. Maniachi has more than just the examples he provided. He's, he can he can mix the elements to be a variation. I hope so because I was you know being the, this other development is great in my neighborhood. 
I've been looking at those, and they still look all the same to me. I don't know what our criteria is, but it's not it's not cutting it for me. For, for some of the applications we get, we, we get one or two elevations, and those are typicals, but, but they, there's variation of those elevations that they can mix and match with. Okay. I think we should review this at some future time to look at how we judge sure. those variations. Sure. Yes, Cooper. Yeah, I have a question. So the variations are... Isn't it also that there's options so that people who are purchasing may end up with all the same because it's a lower price point? And so while the developer may offer multiple variants, what happens if everyone buys the one at the lowest price point and ends up looking the same? And I think that's a problem as well. They need to make multiple variants at the same price point so that everybody doesn't choose the one that looks the same. The building official make, reviews and approves the building permits to ensure that that does not happen. So what you're talking about yeah. does not happen. Ms. Cruz. The spirit of the law can be defined by what is the law intending to accomplish? Why did we write this law? Right. What do we want from this law? Right. That is That is the spirit of the law. And oftentimes we, we find ourselves with laws that are not very well drafted. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately, Mr. Hudson and I can make a living off of that. <laughs> um, so in, in this instance, obviously the spirit of our proposed tree ordinance is to preserve the tree. I feel confident in saying that we will have a tree ordinance a woodlands preservation ordinance passed. We, we absolutely will in some shape or form. There is not one person who sits on council and I don't think one person at this table who thinks that the trees aren't important for some reason or another, if for no other reason than what they give back to nature. So that that is the, the spirit, is what is the law intended to do? Now, I could take that and make that even broader and I could say, as developers come in here and want to work with the city of Troy, not only do they need to meet the minimum requirements of our ordinances, but they also should come to planning commission and to city council and to Troy with the spirit of partnering with us, in the spirit of working with us, because this is a great place for them to be. They're going to make money with their project here, and that's a guarantee. So they should come with the spirit of cooperation and negotiation. And when you have a developer look at you and say, no, I'm not going to add any trees because I meet the ordinance requirements, I'm asking myself where that spirit of cooperation is. Where's the partnering? Where's the let's make this a win-win situation for everybody? Let me give you a little bit of what you want and then you give me some concessions on what I want and then everyone walks away happier. Um, I know this is really cheesy. Does everybody remember what the city of Troy is a city of tomorrow, today. today? When was that tree ordinance written with the four to ten inches? Very much in the past, right? I don't want the city of tomorrow today to become the city of yesterday today. So, I mean, I think that's the spirit of the law as well. We know that people are more conscious of the importance right. of trees today right. than they were you know, decades ago or even, and younger people, we want younger people to move in Detroit. Um, we've talked about this before, and I think that's the spirit of the law, is to find ways to make Troy attractive to everyone. John, I just want to make one comment. I thought we were talking more about, I completely agree with the tree ordinance part of that. I thought you also mentioned the scale of the homes. Not, well, not they are being large. consistent, they, which, which is different than the tree ordinance. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I was right. more focused on. We, we do need housing to attract younger and, and provide for people who want to downsize. No, I, I, I understood. I, I've been part of those conversations yeah. as well. So. Is uh, anyone on the commission ready to offer a, uh, either a resolution or a raise your? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Monster. And I'd be remiss if I don't mention this since I'm the city attorney's representative. If you divide the 
site plan. It has to be based on a violation of the ordinance, or federal, or state law. I haven't heard any commissioner mention a violation of any of those laws. When you deny a site plan, it has to be based on a denial of one of those provisions. And that's my comment. Thank you. Mr. Craig. I just, Alan, I just want to ask you, is there any provision <coughs> for agreements and how the land is used? In other words, a legal agreement between the developer and the owner, if it's not clearly spelled out, is that, is that part of our the purview or not? They have <coughs> proposed making the out lot, as Mr. Hudson pointed out, <coughs> a suitable area, also part of the common elements. You may not like that, but that is allowed under the condominium statute. It's not prohibited, so there's no legal violation. Preferably, you would have some sort of agreement and maintenance and reimbursement of co-owners. I agree, that's, that's a better way to do it. But at this point, it's what they propose is not in violation of the Condominium Act. Anything else? Yeah. Yes. The only other thing I would say is uh, I, I think they fail on the variation. Uh, I don't see anything that's, that shows any variation. And so I could, I want to base my denial of, the, of this request based on the, the facades. The facades. Would you want to put that in the resolution? I guess I could. Anyone else <coughs> want to offer a resolution? Commission agrees that we want to allow Mr. Baniachi to speak again. I yes. would. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, as stated, the, the variations on the, those are, those are typical elevations on the houses. We submitted two different floor plans for 28 lots, four variations, plus alternate variations if a homeowner wants to add additional windows, subtract windows, um, which makes for multiple options on the house, plus brick variation, roof colors, exterior siding, all those are um, individual choices that we allow the homeowners to choose. Through the building department, it's mandated that we're not allowed to have um, similar homes next to each other. It has to be a minimum of 25% variance between elevations per house. So that's, those are just typical um, elevations that we start with and we build from there. Um, we've developed many communities in the city of Troy and we've never had an issue regarding variances, um, variations of types of houses in all of our developments. Okay. I hope so that answers that question for you. If I may follow up. <laughs> so you've built many homes in yes. Troy? Yes, correct. And, uh, so your, your point is that no one ever purchases the base lot only or the we have had people purchase with no options. Frequent? And no, not frequent. Um, normally we get 20% upgrades <laughs> in houses um, throughout the community. Um, so there's usually, we never built the same house next to each other. Again, it's not allowed through the building department and that's um, reviewed at that time. But um, so, and we, put, and we try to scatter the different houses throughout the different communities. But and you would take exception to the statement that uh, if you drive through one of your subdivisions that, that you've uh, done in Troy, that it would be, it would not be correct to state that they all look alike. Is that what you, that's your point? That's my point, correct. Well, I, I've seen, as a matter of fact, right behind my, behind my property, he's got um, five homes and they are so similar have to really have a, a, a different viewpoint to say that they're different, they, they look different. They all look to me the same. And so I'm sticking with what I'm saying. They, they don't, 
I've, I've seen other of these developments, and they are very similar. I don't see any variation in um, height of buildings or um, <coughs> the facade treatments as far as <coughs> different arrangements of windows. Um, maybe a, the difference between um, a two-story and a one-story. There's no ranches. Um, there's no. There's, the architecture is so similar um, that I, I just can't. Maybe it's because I have a design eye. I just I just see it as very so similar that they are not. There's not enough variation for me to say this is what I can approve. This this is this doesn't meet my standards for variation. And again, I realize this is a subjective thing, but still, um, the basic layout that I see with the plans in front of me, I don't see enough variation at all to 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 approve this. So I'm going to move to. Uh, Deny this based on that part of our ordinance. Or do you want to just postpone it? So we could postpone it too. If the uh, if the uh, developer would bring some other <coughs> variations in, in uh, we could postpone it. If if he's sticking to this, we'll I'll deny it. Ms. Cruz, I would be curious to know if the developer is still um, intending to take the position that. He does not care to add additional trees to the interior of his development once it's completed um, in order to replace the trees that have been cut down and to add to curb appeal of the homes and just out of respect for what the trees offer our ecosystem and environment. Um, you guys ask, uh, you guys put some rules and regulations in place for a reason. And you ask us developers to come into town and develop for a reason. And when we know the rules and regulations, yes, we can abide by them. And, and I base my purchase of property by the rules and regulations set forth. I'm happy to abide by all the rules and regulations of the, the Planning Commission. I have not once brought a project in before you that has not abided by all the rules. I've, um, I believe I've exceeded more of the minimum tree requirements in a lot of my communities. And it's all based on the communities that we are building in. I believe this site is well above the minimum requirements that you keep outlining, you, you keep referring to. I, we are going way above and beyond by per preserving the, the green belt along the side property line. I don't, I mean, it's not a requirement. And I know other developers that would not have even put that on the plan to start with and started from a negative as a negotiating point. I bring this to you as a, as a good faith and present this to you guys that I am willing to go above and beyond the minimum standard requirements that you guys set. But the bar is set at the so, so high and I uh, achieve it and I pass the bar and now you guys are throwing me back down saying, well, no, we want you to go higher. I don't know what higher is when you guys say that, I mean, you got to you have to outline what you want, and I'd be more than happy to abide by it. The minimum requirement says I can clear cut the whole site. I'm not doing that. The minimum requirements ask me to put down X amount of trees. I'm well above re the replacement count on the trees, so I'm not. I, I don't understand. As a developer, I stand before you presenting a project that you said. These are the rules we want you to come to us with, and we, I come to you with that, and now you're saying no because I followed the law? I don't understand that. That's where I, un I can appreciate the spirit of the law and the saving of trees. It's not in the ordinance. I might not have bought the property with that intent, or I would have negotiated a better deal to compensate for that. The law says that I can clear cut. I'm not clear cutting the whole site. I am making room for new houses. Mondrian's been in this community for over 25 years. We've built, um, I've been responsible for the replacement of over thousands of trees in the city of Troy. Um, some of my developments have award, uh, won awards for designs. And we're a well-respected builder in the city. Our houses demand some of the highest values. I, we are a contributing factor to the police and fire department. We've donated over a million dollars in assets for police training and fire training. 
you know, we are a well-respected um, developer in the community, and to say that the project doesn't meet your standards because you want something more that's not in the law, I don't, I don't, I can't appreciate. So I do believe that I, I'm presenting you a project that has more than your minimum standards. Was there a comment earlier, though, about more landscaping and trees potentially being in the project than we see displayed? Or is it just the buffer? I remember the audience, yes. But the tree that he was referring to was right in the middle of a lot, which would, you know, negate a different type of layout. Sure. And uh, I think we need to, as a planning commission, I understand, and, and I, I formerly worked for a trade association, and one of the biggest uh, issues of our members was the company need, or the developers in this case, need some kind of certainty as to what is expected. And uh, I understand that argument. And uh, they need, you know, not only the certainty and uh, of what would be approved. I, um, I'm having a real problem with all of this this evening. I think maybe we need to look, as a planning commission, we need to look inside. Maybe we have other areas that need to be strengthened, such as in the building department. So, and I don't know how that would be accomplished, but I don't think that should be an issue uh, in this particular uh, proposal. Mr. Apahidian. I just have a question for Mr. Motsky for my peace of mind, just a little bit of clarification regarding this master deed. Um, is, would adding language to the master deed in terms of additional clauses of how that outlaw is going to be um, dealt with legally and long term, is that a minimum requirement per the ordinance in terms of what we're looking at to approve a preliminary site plan or is that just something that <coughs> we can request but is not necessarily a minimum requirement? It's, it's something we could request but it's not a minimum requirement. The, our ordinance provides that the master deed has to be approved by the city attorney's office, and that occurs after preliminary site plan approval, but before final site plan for approval. When we review the master deed, we review it for legal requirements to make sure it complies with the Condominium Act or any provisions of our ordinance that may be applicable. And so, so, so yeah, that's not, that's something we can request. But it's, it's can we include plan. a provision in the resolution to request clarification for final approval, or is that uh, at this point irrelevant? In, in the we might be able to make some sort of request along the lines when you're doing so pursuant to your duties of planning commissioner to protect the general health, safety, and welfare. I, I think that would be appropriate. And just to follow up, because uh, I think that's something we should perhaps take note of. Uh, in your opinion, would this Master plan deed be approved by the uh, city attorney's office at final approval? We don't have the entire master deed. They're, they provided us with a provision of the master deed. They didn't, oh, it is? Oh, it's not the entire master deed, yeah. So it's hard. I can't answer that without looking at the entire master deed. They provided a provision relating just to the outlaw. So, but based on what they provided, that's how they're going to treat the outlaw. I can't see anything that violates the condom. Okay, we need to uh, have a resolution of some type. <coughs> One I wanted to, to offer to the, um, to the developer is two choices. One is to postpone it, and I would like to see, because I base everything on what was given to us as far as drawings, plans. That's how, I, that's how we can come up with a site plan review. Look at the plans, and the plans to me don't show enough variation between the buildings to allow for any amount of choices. So I would say I could, I could deny this. I offer a resolution to deny it based on lack of variation or postpone this and the developer brings in some new drawings that show enough variation, 
uh, to meet our requirements as far as I see it, uh, I'd go either way. What is the uh, pleasure of the Planning Commission? obviously into the partnering. I'm a big believer in finding ways to negotiate an agreement where everyone can be a winner. Um, and so, you know, I, I would support Mr. Krent's suggestion that we could get the variation. Um, that might be something to, to seriously consider. It, it, th this is this is a tough one. I mean, and, and no matter how you look at it, this is a tough one. It's again, it's not what we need. It's kind of what we're getting, and and it's a tough one. Mr. Afferhead, I just I just had a comment regarding the variations. I think that um, in the past we've had applicants that have come before us that have submitted. Um, requests um, that have brought before us very elaborate colored renderings that we've gotten used to and this applicant for this application all we're looking at is black and white and gray and I think um, it doesn't really do justice to the variation it doesn't give us that variation you see at least the color option so maybe if it does get postponed for our benefit, I mean, to, to help us out, could be given some kind of color some, a color rendering of the variations so we can see that. Um, I mean, personally, I can visualize that. I'm a very visual person. I, I can look at black and white. I can see I can see the variation, but not everybody can do that. So maybe um, that might help. Mr. Sapper. Mr. Chairman, would it help if I read the provision regarding variation and appearance? It's not that long. Please do. Please do, yes. So this is in uh, this is in Article Four under the <coughs> provisions for the R1A through R1E zoning ordinance, which this is under. And it's titled uh, "Variation in Appearance." It says, "In any one-family residential district, there shall be variation in the appearance of the one-family detached residential dwellings. A dwelling's front elevation shall not reoccur in the same or a substantially similar structural form on another dwelling within the same street frontage." without there being at least one other dwelling with a different elevation between the dwellings that repeat the frontage elevation. Different colors alone will not constitute different front elevations. So that's the standard that we apply. And again, some, some, uh, some applicants submit you know, one or two elevations. And, and I mean, I, this is, a lot of the conversation we're talking about tonight, some of the issues I look at uh, through different lenses than other people do. As an example, the outlaw, Mr. Hudson's looking at it through the lens of an attorney. I'm looking at it through the lens of, a, of a, someone involved in zoning and code enforcement. We're looking at it from different perspectives. Same goes for elevations. And I look at an elevation, I see if, even if it's, oh, there's only one submitted, I look at it and say, well, they, you know, they'll change up the dormer, they'll, they'll, they'll swap out the windows, they'll, sh they'll sh I, I look at ways that that, that can be modified. Through, through the form can be changed. Um, I, your point is well taken. If it's unclear to you that the ver if you think the ver there's not enough variation, I'm sure Man Mr. Maniachi can provide drawings that, that show that variation. That's, that's something that we, we do administratively, but if you feel more comfortable with it, it is a design standard, but you can certainly ask for that. Mr. Craig, well, no, I will, if I, before I do, sure. I, sure. I uh, did you have something else to say? I'm sorry. No. Um, perhaps we can craft resolution to postpone that encompasses not only Mr. Hudson's issue because as well as uh, Ms. Uh, Cruz's and uh, yours on the variation and uh, we'll see where that goes okay thank you and I just want to I think the key word in that ordinance is the word substantial and to me having 
the door, the entrance in the same spot, the garage in the same spot, or the window layouts in the same spots with just the difference between a hip or a gable roof, that's not substantial to me. That's not an architectural substantially different home. So um, I'm going to stick with my you know, interpretation of the ordinance, not substantial. I would support Tom's position on this. Um, I, I, listening, and I appreciate you reading the ordinance, but I, I, I can't see that the, the, the ordinance requirement has been met with what we have in our packet. So I would support postponing to, to see the third I just wanted to read it so we we're all on the same page. No, I appreciate, I appreciate that. It was very thoughtful, thoughtful of you to so do thank it. You. Okay. okay, Mr. Craig. I, uh, I would uh, make a, a motion to uh, postpone this based on that the uh, developer does not meet our standards for variation of architectural facades um, for this development. And two. And two. Oh, Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson's uh, due diligence is uh, looking into the agreement between the developer and the um, the eventual property owners. Master plan deed. Okay, thank you. The master plan deed needs to be clarified. And Ms. Cruz. Do you want something added? Did you want something added? I don't know if asking the developer to provide 2,200 square foot homes with, mm -hmm. you know, the master bedroom suite on the first floor, is that too much? No, I think but, I, no but I'd be in the market for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. Personally, Ms. Cruz, I think it is a little over the top. Do you, do you but, think that's a little But over I would love now? to see that because I've heard so many people Tell me why are we building these huge homes? I want to downsize. I want right. to. I want an elegant home, though. I don't want to move into a 1960s That's three right. bedroom, two bathroom, or bathroom and a half stuff. I That's want right. something that that is in that upper range of quality and appearance, but is not a, a giant home. So, That's but right. um, but unfortunately, yeah, we can't. Reality is, we can't. Mr. Bonnier <laughs> has no problem selling his home. That's like true to it. So but if he could consider it, that. We can't say anything about clear cutting either, can we? No, nah, not really. Not yet. I, I still, I still would like for him to reconsider adding some additional trees. I mean, I understand that he's not going to cut down the buffers, but um, and I'm thankful for that. Right, I'm thankful oh, for sure. that. But th that just because you're going to leave what's already there, that to me, that's going, that's not going above and beyond. That's just saving yourself the trouble of clearing it away. Well, that's not a totally true. Uh, by the way. Off of my opinion, as a gardener and someone, you're much better off trying to preserve a tree in a in a belt like that than you are trying to preserve a tree, even though it's huge and would be probably a landmark tree on one of these lots. The chances are, there's a good chance that that tree would not survive. So, um, I understand that. So, okay. So is that part of our resolution too? Yes. I would like for him to reconsider okay. adding some trees in the interior of the site plan design. Ms. Sardiki, did you get all that? Mm -hmm. Wow, she's good. <laughs> does anyone does anyone now want to hear the resolution again? No further discussion. Will the vote please? Mr. Hudson? This is a motion to postpone? Yes. 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 Mr. Krent? Yes. Ms. Kupra? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Akaherdian? No. Ms. Cruz? No. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Faisler? Yes. Motion carries.
Sure. Uh, I, I sent all the Planning Commission members an email this morning um, out of courtesy because uh, uh, because you did have involvement in, uh, in preparing the draft uh, last night at the uh, City Council meeting. The um, proposed movement protection language was uh, was denied uh, with a 4-3 vote. Very, very close vote, and, and uh, uh, the, the message is, uh, I don't believe it's necessarily, um, although it was denied, I don't, I don't think that the, the process is necessarily over. Um, to, be, to be honest, although I was very optimistic that we could uh, put together a, a draft in a very, time, a very, very good quality draft in a timely fashion, Lying if I said there wouldn't be some some hiccups along the way, at, you know, whatever, wherever throughout the process, because it, it happens. So, um, trying to characterize the reasons for the the, the four three vote it was actually a three four vote. It was a, in the affirmative, <coughs> three, three yeses and four nos. So, um, trying to and, and Ben, feel free to to, to, to jump in. But um, I, well, I, th I I think I'll, I'll just quote at least two of the of the city council members that didn't vote for it was the planning commission had five at least five meetings to consider the matter discuss the matter between amongst the group um, and and last night was the, really the first and only chance that, that the city council did and those members didn't feel comfortable voting on the ordinance last night until there was an early discussion um, they didn't really necessarily have any um, some concerns about anything in the ordinance per se it was just that they didn't feel comfortable voting on it without some further discussion of the council as a whole. That's the reason why the vote went three to four. Yeah. And, and I think added to that the fact that 
there are two new city council members. Mm -hmm. This is their first bite at the apple, so to speak. And as, as a, a board that is involved with the zoning ordinance and with, with, with zoning ordinance text amendments, you see this language all the time. It was, I believe, an 11 page amendment. I mean, it's pretty significant with some mathematical mathematic formulas that, that I look at, and to me, it's all oh, it's easy peasy. Well, I've been looking at this thing for five months, so it's um, so I can see, I can certainly see um, where they were coming from. The, the positive the positive noted there, there were three yeses who were ready to who voted to support support the language as written. So, um, with, with with that being said, uh, and Mr. Motsi, I'll, I'll lean on you for uh, for for your legal background. Um, th there is the the potential for city council under what is what is the document that allows them to reconsider? The, the rules of procedure for city yeah. council allows them to reconsider any vote. And, uh, and they have, but they have to do that at the next meeting. Is that correct? Or does, does it matter? I don't think there's a okay. restriction on that. But doesn't it have to be a member who voted no to bring it up for reconsideration? That Robert's rules say that, but the city council rules of procedure say any member <laughs> even could vote. They they amended Robert. I guess rules. okay. That was done quite a while ago. Yes. So, so even the, the people who voted who uh, voted for the resolution could make the could bring it up for other reconsideration. So, so given the fact that there were three of the seven members of the council who voted in the affirmative, and there were also two members who, who were talking about having a study meeting, I certainly think there's 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 the potential opportunity for this to be considered by them in the future. So. With a positive result. With a positive result. I mean, I can't say for sure, but um, so I, I, I think it may, there may be some benefit, and, and Ms., Mr. Chairman Edmonds and I discussed this today. Um, there may be some uh, some benefit for the Planning Commission passing a resolution this evening uh, encouraging City Council to reconsider um, their, vote. The, their, their vote and perhaps uh, perhaps bring it, move it forward uh, as a study item in, in the future. So that's something that we wanted to bounce off the planning commission this evening. So and that would potentially speed up the, the process of getting them to look at the ordinance and discuss it? Potentially uh, getting, um, you know, encouraging, encouraging them to have that, that, that study meeting. I'm in. Yeah. Okay, resolution, I don't see any downside to it. Okay. The only thing I would, I, I'm looking at your proposed mm -hmm. language here and, and, I, and I appreciate that you've had Mr. Moss to review this and everything already. But I'm wondering if where it says that the move the second, second or last line and schedule a Troy City Council study session, perhaps we could change that wording to say a joint Troy City Council Planning Commission study session. Because I think some of the Planning Commission members would uh, want to be a part of that study session. Make sense or you know, I, I don't know. I think that we've kind of beaten a dead horse with city council on this, and they might have a little freer discussion without, without the planning commission there. But having Brent and city attorney and our consultant uh, available to answer questions, I, I would agree. That I, that's fine. Yeah, and this does that does not preclude members of the planning commission also attending the study session. No, well. it's open to the public, right? Yes. Yeah. steps for them? I mean, would they come out of the study session and would it be on an agenda or would it have to even be placed on a future agenda or is there, is there no guidance to that? I guess it depends what comes out of the study session. No, if they're, we're asking them to consider this at their next meeting. Yes. Right. So, I, I, it's my understanding that then um, they can either ignore it you know, it's a request, or they can move forward and, and uh, I'm just, is that correct, Mr. Moss? I misunderstood your question. Of <coughs> well, I, I was, okay, I was assuming they agreed to have a okay. study session. Okay. So then I asked, so, so what is the next, what are the options for the next steps? Do they come out of the study session that evening at City Council <coughs> or is it on the agenda, or is it on a future agenda, or is there no rules or no guidance for that, whatever they want? Pretty much, there's already been two public hearings on the, the, the 
ordinance that there, there's no requirement for another public hearing, although they could schedule another public hearing if they chose to do so. Mm -hmm. they, they, they could decide, and we're talking, we're speculating here totally, yeah. but to talk about what, it really depends on what the outcome is of that meeting because right. they could they could s suggest some substantive changes to the to right. the, uh, the now they could they could they could revise the 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 draft language without sending it back to planning commission. They have that authority. They have that authority, mm -hmm. but they could decide that because the planning commission was was vested with the previous efforts to send it back to get their input. So we really it's hard to answer that question because it really depends on. How the meeting goes and what the outcome is of the meeting. Well, you have answered it. There's, it's across the board. It's across all the board. Kinds of options. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing of note, I think, is the, the last few phrase where it says not only woodland protection and an enhanced cluster option. Yeah. Uh, for those, I would, I'll, I would at this point just urge everyone to at, watch that portion of the meeting again. It really is insightful, and, and I think you'll have a better feel for why they did what they did. And, and that's an important, important point. And and we can, um, what we'd like, we think would be would be very effective is we got some uh, some feedback from city council last night, suggesting that the effectiveness of the woodland protection provisions, if it moves forward as written, would be greatly enhanced if we had cluster option provisions enhanced. that were enhanced yes. by encouraging clustering, incentivizing clustering. Perhaps even incentivizing the construction of some of the, the units that Ms. Cruz mentioned this evening. I mean, I think we have a cluster option. So just so everyone knows what clustering is, clustering is, is administratively allowing a relaxation of some of our standards, such as setbacks, uh, rear side and front yard setbacks, allowing clustering, which is moving the, the, the units closer together to preserve some natural features, uh, you know, as, as an example. And, and for the, doing the, that, they get a... They put potentially get a density bonus as an incentive. So the, the more they preserve, the more <laughs> trees they save, the more open space they preserve, they could get a density bonus. So it, it, we get a higher quality development in terms of the open space that's, that's preserved or enhanced. Perhaps it's a field right now, but they plant trees and they create positive you know, uh, nat natural features. So these are some of the things we're talking about. But the, the cluster provisions that we have in our zoning ordinance now are very difficult to meet. Very difficult to meet. For example, to get that density bonus, you have to maintain 50% of open space, common open space. That's a very high number to meet. It is hard. So um, we could we, we could look at that and we can give that a high priority like we did the wetland protection order. You know, Brent, just thinking, yeah. I would almost in an effort to get this Woodlands ordinance passed quickly if you're such a creature, that we not tag it with an enhanced cluster agreement because it's automatically say, well, that's part of it. We don't know anything about it. Send it back, and we're going to spend more months gnashing on that. Why can't we just separate them and go ahead with a revision of the cluster ordinance independently of that? Well, well, we could. I think the 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 resolution that that's the proposed resolution that's before you um, recognizes the relationship. We've got one ordinance draft written, um, but. One of the one of the outcomes of tonight's meeting was to kind of get the, the go ahead from the planning commission to start to, to request that we start working on it immediately. That on the cluster on the, on the cluster. Why yes. Not? Yes. Right. And I go ahead, Mr. Tick. I was just going to ask uh, because of the input that you got from council and that you added the cluster language, is there anything that would come out of their study session that would help us understand uh, what maybe is on their mind about the cluster? Uh, you know, enhancements or what, I mean, right. instead of start, start, starting from square zero, you know, if they can give us some insight into what they're thinking, <coughs> that may be helpful for us. Right, and, that, and that's one, because that, that dialogue, I think, is related. We're not, it's not necessary. I don't know whether they're going to dovetail the two together or not. It's, it's yes. that's up to them. Um, but certainly the issues overlap. Mm -hmm. the, the issues overlap. And it, I think that type of dialogue to get that feedback not only on the woodland protection but also on, the, on, on clustering and that concept I think right. is important. I think it's important to state for those of you who have been uh, longer planning commission members, this cluster option has been a real kind of sore point that, you know, 
we have very, very few, I think maybe we can count on our one hand, the number of Pete and other developers who have used the cluster option. And it's because of the provisions you know, that, that, that are certainly in. If we have an enhanced cluster option, it gives much more uh, options to increase the density. I think many of the uh, many of the uh, concerns we've all had in the past. Uh, I, I think it makes good sense personally because I've been on the planning commission for about eight years now, and I, I think we really uh, this would really help. I, I've always been really disappointed that no developer they always take the cookie cutter approach because it's easy. And uh, with the cluster and we option, keep approving it. Yes, we do. Unfortunately, because that's. That's the ordinance, that's the law. <laughs> okay. So, having said all that, there's a proposed resolution that has been passed out to each one of you. Uh, some of you want to have further discussion, we can do that now, or we can uh, consider this uh, proposed resolution. So, I just, I have a yes. question. Yes. Why would you not want to have, if, if they are going to discuss enhanced cluster, if they are going to discuss their own wording, why wouldn't you want to have an open study session with the Planning Commission and them, since we put so much effort into developing the resolution? Well, I'll give you my impression. I, I think if we get a large structured council and Planning Commission sitting around this table with 30 people on both sides, a half a city administration here, there's really not much of an opportunity for a free flow of uh, ideas uh, and discussion. Dialogue, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, we've had joint meetings with them in the past, and, and uh, I agree with Mr. Hudson. Perhaps let's just leave it up to them. We can always be invited. You know, I don't, you know, they, uh, they, uh, they read the minutes of this meeting, and, and uh, so I think that, that could be part of, part of it. Uh, to, to piggyback on Mr. Hudson's comment, uh, one could say that the Planning Commission has already spoken by resolution, by unanimously approving the language. Right, correct, right. But I think it's important as a result of this, this discussion on this agenda item tonight, as you've always said, the Planning Commission speaks through its resolutions. So if this resolution includes our thoughts on this whole area, I think we need to pass this resolution. Ms. Cruz. Um, I have one final thing, and, and that is I want to support uh, Mr. Hudson's comment about um, looking at the cluster option and the Woodlands Protection Ordinance separately and independently. What I would hate to see happen is that the Woodland Protection Ordinance, which we all know is outstanding, to get mired down in the muck of cluster um, zoning um, because until something is passed, our hands are tied with what we can do to move forward. So I, I, I really would encourage that, that council understands that, you know, I, I know we want cluster and I support that, but let's get this woodland thing done so that we at least have something going forward as developers come in and, and want to get site plan approval. That's a really good point because there is a risk that perhaps even just the cluster option would pass and the woodland protection would be denied. Or, or they all get stalled like molasses in the process, right? And, and we don't want that. How about two, two resolutions? You do the first one, put a period after woodland protection, and do a separate resolution uh, moving forward to a study immediately of the cluster option uh, in conjunction with uh, perhaps the passing of the woodlands ordinance. Please tell council we're starting right now, even though it's not part of the first resolution. I, I think he, uh, he clarified it. May I? Uh, yes. I'm just going to say, I think that does a good clarification. Uh, I would think that council would look at the existing wording and just say, well, uh, fine, we, we've got two things here to, to work on. We'll work on one right now. Or, we don't have to work on them in conjunction, but as opposed to just letting it up to them to maybe not understand what we're trying to say, I think you clarified. I think we should have it separated. That's fine. Let's get Mr. Bosky's uh, opinion on having another, on uh, Mr. Uh, Hudson's uh, 
wording where you stop after woodland protection period and then say be it further resolved. Sure, we could do two rounds of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who well, wants to do that? Mr. Hudson? <laughs> Volunteer to work on a committee to become <laughs> chairman. As soon as you open your mouth, you ask it becomes your job. <laughs> All right. Resolved that the Planning Commission encourages the Troy City Council to reconsider its vote at the February 8, 2016 City Council meeting on the proposed text amendment to Articles 8 and 13 of Chapter 39, parentheses, adding woodland protection provisions to the zoning ordinance in parentheses, comma, and schedule a Troy City Council study session to discuss the woodland protection period. Be it further resolved that the Planning Commission commence immediately the study in the hopes of formatting a revised enhanced cluster option for inclusion within the city zoning ordinances. I like Perfect. That. I'll second that. Yes, <laughs> I think we all would. Okay, uh, Mr. Hudson and seconded by Mr. Uh, Krebs. Further discussion? If not, the roll call vote, Ms. Sarnicki. Mr. Krentz? Yes. Ms. Kupa? Yes. Mr. Tagel? Yes. Mr. Abahidian? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Faison? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Thank you very much. Good. All right, our last item uh, tonight is the uh, public comment. I just wanted to ask if Mr. Uh, Mr. could give us that thing about one stop um, ready that you sent out today. Just that, that's my only comment. Let it go around, and when it gets to you, I appreciate you just commenting on that. Oh. On, on the on the the email you sent the, out the program. Yes, I didn't see it. I must have read it that earlier today. Okay. I'm talked out. <laughs> Mr. Faison. Nothing for me. Um, I did not get to see your email that you sent this morning because I don't get to it till I get home because I don't have access at work. Um, so if there is an important vote like that, I would appreciate that you give me a call if you could. I'm How about just giving him his your email at the work? Would that work? I think the we problem is that, yeah, we need to, yeah, we need to make it more easy for him. So I got to, we'll talk offline, but I okay. need a way to hear about something potentially big. Give, give me a, give me a work email with like the, you know, for important, really important things yeah. on it. That's good. That's good. Mr. Tegel. Um, yeah, for me tonight, one of the challenges I had was the history with this developer. Mondrian has come in before and uh, basically done what we've all talked about tonight, not wanting to be done. Um, and then the other part was just, uh, I think Karen has hit upon it several times, is lack of cooperation, uh, not only with this commission, but I almost asked him if he had talked to any of the residents, because uh, we've taken that route before too, when, when there is some friction between residents and the developer, we'll go work it out. It sounds like he hadn't. It, it sounds like he hadn't. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't know where it goes from here. Um, he's, he's going to come back with some enhanced elevations, uh, which will supposedly uh, you know, satisfy the uh, ordinance, uh, and, then, and then probably the project will move forward. But we really, like we've all said, we need to uh, encourage this woodlands protection ordinance to be voted in and uh, move on. So, yeah. but even if it's voted in at this point. Oh, no, I, I mean, yeah, so this, this, this the train has left the station with this right. project. Right. It's the, uh, the target date or the deciding date is the date of the application. I understand. Okay. I, I have nothing further, and uh, thank you all for... Oh, oh I'm sorry, Mr. Stavina. Yes. As per sorry. Mr. Krantz's request, yes, One Stop sorry. Ready is a, uh, is a program that's put on by Oakland County. Um, I've attended the sessions. I believe Mr. Evans, Mr. Krent, am I missing someone who's also attended the sessions? It's essentially... It's a, I'd call it an informational type uh, uh, program. They meet uh, four or five times in the evening and uh, they go over uh, best management practices for, for uh, planning departments and, and, uh, and zoning departments throughout Oakland County. 
they, they, they look at uh, uh, successful success, successful departments and how they, in a fast, fair, predictable fashion, uh, review and approve applications. It's uh, it's very informative. It's a really good program. It's a good program. It's uh, the price is right. It's free of charge. Mm -hmm. Got time? You want to learn a little bit more about it? I encourage you to attend. And they provide food. Yep. <laughs> I did try to register today on that mm -hmm. from their link, and it sent me to their link was not working properly. Mm -hmm. So I'll give them a call tomorrow. Yeah. So just let you know it may not. If you're really eager and try to get on tonight, it may not work. <laughs> and if you notice, I passed the buck on to everyone here because it's free. Yeah. You yes. can you're take right. care of it all yourself. Right. So everyone wants to go, right. I encourage you to go. <laughs> but take care of it. If you have, if you haven't done it in the past, I would encourage you. To Okay, having uh, nothing else, anyone else have anything? Uh, we are adjourned.